All right. And I am now delighted to introduce our next two speakers who are joining us from Deloitte Australia in platform engineering business. Also, my team. Uh, I have to admit, I'm not sure what is more nerve wracking, emceeing a technical event where my own technical expertise is, let's say, slightly under par, or emceeing a technical event and introducing two of my colleagues whom I hold in very high esteem. In Deloitte, our platform engineering team builds secure, robust and scalable platforms that are responsive to changing business needs. In delivering these solutions, we embed modern systems engineering practices that accelerate value and embrace continuous improvement. Liz Douglas has recently joined Deloitte as our partner for modern engineering. Not afraid to challenge the status quo in order to deliver positive outcomes, Liv has, Liz has uh, worked as a software developer, an aerospace engineer, right through to leading engineering teams for Coles, IIG and Medibank. Liz also shares one of my passions, championing careers for women in the technology sector. Saul Kaganoff, in my mind, is one of the true champions of API Days Australia. He's been instrumental in bringing the event down under during his time at Sixtree and now with Deloitte. Saul's done everything from delivering major system integration and software development projects in Australia, the US and Asia, to taking on acting general manager positions at some of Australia's largest companies. Saul's passion for excellence and knowledge sharing is a key source of inspiration for our team at Deloitte to continue to strive to be better and more collaborative every day. I also hear that with a background as an ex-NASA scientist, he's got some great stories to share over a beer. So please welcome Liz and Saul, who are going to join forces today to talk to you about growing domain APIs, taint what you do. Over to you. Great. Thank okay. you, Beck. Thanks, Beck. That's great. My pleasure. Let me share the presentation and see if we can get this into and can presentation. You hear me? Yes. And so just checking that I've got audio as well. Yes, we can hear your thank audio. Thank you. Um, are you seeing my screen? Correctly? Yes, thank you. Um, ah, right. Okay, so Liz, do you want to start? Terrific. Well, thank you so much for the, uh, the warm introduction, Beck. Um, my name is Liz Douglas, and as Beck said, I'm one of the partners in Deloitte's platform engineering practice. And I'm Saul Kaganoff, um, CTO of Platform Engineering. So our talk today is split into three parts. Um, in part one, we're going to look at some common problems and anti-patterns that we see um, around the integration and API space. In part two, we're going to be looking at what does better look like. Uh, imagine a, a better world that we could work in. And in part Part three, we'll look at technique for um, moving into those better ways of working, which is all about growing your core applications into domains and APIs. Okay, terrific. And just before we move on, so uh, I think we need to maximise or switch screens. Uh, so do I need to swap displays? I actually can't see the screen. Is that it? Yes, beautiful. All right. Okay. Uh, right, so part one, um, common problems and anti-patterns. So in platform engineering, we specialize in enterprise integration and we work with dozens of different clients across a range of different industries. Each of them has different levels of digital maturity. And a common thread we see is that organizations are really wanting to deliver technology faster and at reduced cost. <clears throat> um, and we're in the, the fortunate position or the lucky position where we can see many different responses to that challenge of going faster and reducing costs. And we see, um, we see a lot of what works and a lot of what also doesn't work. So there are common anti-patterns and common problems that emerge from uh, the, the way companies organise around these challenges. 
So the first type of anti-pattern that we see is around bottlenecks. And the symptoms of this are often that um, teams are waiting for their APIs to be implemented. And this happens commonly where you have a dependency on a centralized team to be developing APIs. Um, we also see sometimes that there's contention on shared infrastructure or indeed um, teams that are just bogged down by having too much technical debt. Um, we often see um, what we call silo behavior. So this is where you may have duplicate APIs, lots of slightly different copies of the same API, all doing essentially the same thing. Um, think about your own organization. How many copies of customer API do you potentially have? Uh, we also see um, you know, a, a kind of related problem to this is not achieving the benefits of reuse. If you're creating a slightly new API each time you need a slightly new feature, then you're not reusing existing assets and you're not achieving the cost and the time savings from that reuse. And the third type of anti-pattern that we see is around contention. And in this context, we're talking about contention between versions. So either the scenario where you have a proliferation of APIs um, because they're just not being retired. And so, you know, to Saul's point, you might end up with lots and lots of versions of the old customer API, or indeed um, you're churning through versions very quickly and teams consuming those APIs are really struggling to keep up with those, those changes in the API. Okay, and when we thought about um, these problems and these symptoms that we commonly see, we um, trace them back to some intermediate causes. So what you can see on the screen here um, is firstly, um, the root cause around a number of those symptoms being ownership. So um, teams that have dependencies on tasks or infrastructure that belong to a different team and therefore they're not fully in control of the APIs which are being developed. And in a similar vein, some of the root causes we decided were about durability, which in this case is about the attention span or the ability of the team to own them as a product over a long period of time. And finally, um, we also thought about prioritization as another root cause of um, how teams can collaborate over a long period of time over a, sh a shared asset. And related to that is visibility. So making sure that people are aware of what's available to them and what is planned as coming up in the future. And then we decided to go another level of detail again. So ownership and durability, we thought, are really driven by the level of autonomy that a team has, which in turn is driven by uh, the delivery model that they use. And similarly, road, the roadmap and the visibility of that roadmap and what's already in production are really driven by the alignment that teams have across the broader organisation. And ultimately, that comes down to the governance model that an organisation uses. Yeah, this, this, um, this traceability that we've done of these problems through their root causes all the way back to considerations of team autonomy and alignment through kind of governance, visibility and standards. That remind us, reminded us a lot of uh, a model that um, was promoted by Henrik Nyberg from Spotify when he talked about the Spotify engineering culture. And he also talks about team autonomy and alignment across the different teams as a, as a way that it's important to have both of these characteristics. A lot of agile techniques or a lot of companies who are just new to agile put a, a big emphasis on autonomy. They want their teams to be self-contained, to, to have all the permissions and the tools that they need to just, to, to just deliver. Um, and that's great if everyone's moving in the same direction, but quite often without that alignment, you will find that autonomous teams can actually move in different or even opposing directions. And therefore the enterprise as a whole doesn't 
um, doesn't really get anywhere or doesn't move faster. You need both autonomy to move fast and alignment to move fast in the same Absolutely. So, so we can overlay this diagram uh, from an integration perspective um, and we see similar patterns in the organisations that we work with. So in fact, most organisations that we speak to are not in that top right quadrant. Um, they're in the top left quadrant. And organisations that are here usually have a fairly typical approach um, or traditional approach rather to integration. And that's usually characterised by having a centralised team that does the integration work. And what's great about that model, in fact, is that you have a high degree of alignment by virtue of the fact that the team is all sitting together. And they have, as a result, a ability to discover what's already available for use or reuse and a high level of consistency about what they are delivering. But unfortunately, they exhibit one of the most common symptoms that we started off by talking about, which is that they are often the bottleneck for a lot of the, the work that needs to happen in the team. Yeah, so, so a common response to the bottleneck is that an organisation can decide we're going to be agile and we're going to disband the integration factory team and we're going to move towards loosely coupled um, pro autonomous project squads. And they, um, as a result of this, they move from the top left corner, which is okay but not fast, down into the bottom right corner, which becomes lots of disconnected projects um, without much cohesion or, or alignment between them. In actual fact, what they need to do is retain some level of governance model, which allows them, so a combination of governance and alignment, which allows them to move horizontally across to the top right, the sweet spot where they've got a good governance model which provides standards and uh, alignment across the different projects, but each project in its own right or each squad in their own right has um, the right level of autonomy to move fast. Absolutely. Um, so the question is, how do we get there? I mean, not everybody has the ability to uh, make decisions about the way that their team is structured or the way that their organisation is governed. So what does that mean? How can we actually move to this in a really practical way? Right. So what does better look like, Liz? Um, Good question. Thank you, Saul. So <laughs> one of our favourite books at the moment is Project Project to Product, which is a book by Nick Kirsten. And in the book, he describes um, that there are four types of flows for teams to be working on at any one point in time. So there's feature flow where you're building out new capability. There's defect flows where you are correcting any errors that you found. There's risk mitigation flows where you're um, proactively preventing uh, issues from occurring in the first place. And there's technical debt flow where you're paying down the debt that you might have otherwise accumulated uh, while working on some of the other flow types. And the point that Mick makes in the book is that you constantly have to balance all of these four flow types. And it's a constant case of making trade-offs between them. And the important thing is that um, even throughout the entire product life cycle, you need to prevent any one of them from stagnating. So the problem with projects in many organisations is that they don't properly address all of these um, types of flow. Generally, projects are obsessed with features and when defects get in the way, then they'll fix them, but they're not necessarily good at uh, addressing risks and they're, they're very often not very good at addressing technical debt. In fact, technical debt we see gets forgotten about and left behind in, in a lot of, uh, lot of organisations. So projects, because they've got a compartmentalised scope and time, they, they really are incentivised to just get it done. Let's just get the features out. Let's deliver on, on time and on budget. And if we have to take shortcuts, we'll fix it later. And of course, later never happens. 
So projects result in short-term incentives. Uh, they have no consequences for those shortcuts. Anytime a project lays down technical debt through these shortcuts, it's usually the following projects that pay the price or it's the enterprise as a whole that pays the price. Uh, another problem with projects is that they, they typically look, as, look at everything as evergreen. It's very difficult to reuse somebody else's stuff in a project because reuse creates dependencies and potentially risk for that particular project. So rather than go and reuse some other, someone else's asset, it's often easier for them to just start from scratch and build it themselves under their own control. So overall, projects are really hampered in their ability to promote durable, reusable assets, such as APIs. Yeah, and we thought about um, the integration space in particular, and because you can keep on building them with impunity, I think this is further compounded um, in the project domain. So the way we think to get to that top right quadrant that we spoke about just a moment ago is to adopt more product thinking. And teams that do that um, have durability. So they have a roadmap of the, what they're gonna build that takes into consideration how to evolve what they already have. They also know their customers well and are able to therefore express the domain in which they're working really well. And importantly, they have a product manager who is in the position to really maintain and defend, if necessary, the integrity of how that um, product is um, expressing the domain. Yeah, that idea of maintaining the integrity is really important. Um, part of autonomy, an important part of autonomy is being able to say no, being able to understand what makes a good product and being able to turn down requests that will um, will impact the integrity of that product. So we all have examples that we've seen in integration projects where there's some problem in the underlying application or some uh, wrinkle in the the business process and there's a lot of pressure to oh, let's just fix it up in the integration layer um, and you know that that's going to be creating bad behaviors or bad technical debt but often within the the confines and the the get it done uh, context of a project you don't have a strong ability to push back um, so you end up with um, with you know quick fixes uh, in the integration layer that get uh, forgotten about and cause problems down the track. Um, you know, part of being a good product manager and having an autonomous um, stance within your organization is being able to shape um, the product and shape it in the face of um, forces which might uh, uh, corrupt the integrity of that product. Absolutely. So to summarize what we've established so far is that um, there are common anti-patterns that drive um, some of the symptoms where, which we opened with. And for the most part that they are um, as a result of both the governance model and the delivery model, which is used inside the organization. And what we want to get to is a state where everybody is able to operate in that top right quadrant where you have high alignment and also high autonomy. And in this section, we've established that the best way to get there is to adopt product thinking. But I mean, a lot of people are probably listening to this and thinking, well, that sounds great, but how, how on earth do I do that? Right, so we acknowledge that uh, the, uh, the, products, the product thinking is very difficult to achieve in many organizations. And this is largely because we're so entrenched in the project paradigm. We're, you know, we've got a legacy of probably 50 years of project-based thinking around how we deliver new features um, through information technology. And that 50 years of that project paradigm has, has leached into every aspect of the way that we work um, within the concepts that we have. So our mental models are all built around 
projects and Gantt charts and burn down rates and all of those kinds of things. And they often make it difficult for us to imagine that there are different ways of doing things. It pervades the language that we use and the skills that we choose within our teams or that we promote within our teams. Project thinking also pervades our processes and the processes that we have for addressing or not addressing the four different flow types, the, the way that we manage features and deliveries and defect management, et cetera, within a fixed time and fixed cost structure. Um, the way that we fund projects, the way that we have these annual funding cycles where we lay down, uh, allocate funds to particular projects uh, all around um, time and delivery and sequencing and those kinds of things. They're, they're very episodic funding cycles with not a lot of ability to go back and change as we've learned more. Um, so we need kind of durable funding to go with durable products. And also um, it pervades our organisational structures. So quite often you'll find in very project oriented organisations, it's the project managers that have the power, that have the, that have the budgets to make decisions around these kinds of things. But there are other interests within the organisation. So there's the, the enterprise architects who are looking after longer term view of the organisation and they're you know, what organisations have product managers? Um, this is a title which is very new to the Australian context, although we have seen a lot more um, experience with product management coming out of um, the US and Silicon Valley. Yeah, absolutely. And, and related to this is is the way that we procure and and actually end up thinking about how how assets are, um, are constrained, really. So we often find in organisations where there is an emphasis on the project paradigm that they also typically buy software and specifically COTS products and buy these, um, these boxes effectively and then uh, customise them, attempting to configure them, but, but often customization follows. And what's interesting is that you end up with a case where the boundary of the capability is the boundary of the COTS product. Um, and, and then the integration that sits in between all these boxes is just sort of something that you have to do. And in fact, is often procured separately to the, um, to the product which is selected. So this really does have a substantial impact on how organisations think about integration. Yeah, as, as a result of this um, this project orientation and this application orientation, <clears throat> um, integration becomes a thing that we do. So um, we tend to orient around applications. Um, integration is delivered within projects which might be decoupled from those applications. Um, integration becomes really a concern about drawing the lines between the boxes. Uh, it's often regarded as an obligation, something that you have to do, something that you'd rather not do, um, rather than something with uh, inherent value. Uh, and so delivering integration within projects like this makes it really difficult to create durable, reusable APIs as assets. Yeah, absolutely. And all of the things in the middle of um, the two boxes down the bottom fall between the cracks, really, in lots of cases. So design, build, run, etc., all fall between the asset boundaries. So why don't we flip this model on its head? Um, Liz, you can... <laughs> you can yeah, sure. So the model. best... <laughs> thanks. So the best way that we've found uh, is to give roadmap responsibility and the ownership for the assets to... Uh, to the teams that are long lived and often they are the team which is responsible also for that core asset. And they have the benefit of being consistently funded um, and they can take up this responsibility and they have another additional benefit which is that they have the best knowledge of the use cases for the end users as well as the domain in which they sit. So if we expand the asset boundary beyond just the application boundary, 
um, we can get the durability of APIs and better likelihood of visibility and reuse by attaching and reassociating uh, this responsibility. So if we look at what this means, uh, we can go through a, an evolutionary process where we draw these boundaries around the application, but rather than calling them an asset boundary or an application boundary, we turn them into domain boundaries. So a domain boundary is a capability within the enterprise, like customer management, like financial management, like transactions, payments, etc. That domain expresses business capabilities via APIs and event streams. And that domain still has those core applications, those off-the-shelf applications are at the core of the domain. They still have their place as systems of record, but we also augment them with secondary uh, applications and microservices for things like uh, customization or uh, internal integrations, etc. And these tightly controlled domain boundaries become a scaffold for modernization of our applications within the domain with minimal impact outside the domain. So if other parts of the organization are accessing those domain capabilities through APIs, then what goes on inside the domain can really uh, be controlled and modernized um, almost with impunity, if you like. And so we get to a, a high level enterprise picture where we're delivering the organization's products and services and capabilities out through different channels to our customers, our employees and our partners. And those capabilities, although they're delivered through channels, ultimately reside in domain APIs and event streams, which are ultimately provided by um, assets, applications, microservices inside those domains. Absolutely. So we've reached our target state, uh, which is that integration is, is not something that we just do um, reluctantly on projects, that it becomes something that is a byproduct of, um, of the domain and in fact forms uh, the boundary of the asset in a redefined way which um, is supported by a team that has both high autonomy and a high level of alignment. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, so we've uh, covered the common anti-patterns that we see in organizations that are operating in that top left-hand quadrant, or indeed sometimes have accidentally moved into the bottom right-hand quadrant. Um, we looked at some of the underlying causes for these issues and have proposed that the aim is to get to that top right. So to achieve both high alignment and high autonomy. And we've spoken about how product thinking positions the team the best to be able to get to that state. And that an achievable way to adopt a product thinking approach is for the asset teams to become the durable owners of domain APIs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Liz and Saul. Uh, we do have a question from Srinivas. He's asked, uh, is asset the same as application in this context? Oh, great question. Saul, I feel like we need to go back to one of the earlier slides, maybe 18. Yes, let me just project that up there. Thank you. Um, 18. So is that up there now? Yeah, if you can just, um, yes. yeah, perfect. So, yeah, so I guess what we're calling a, a durable asset, an asset is something that has a long lived value within the organization. It's often perceived by the business as being valuable, right? And often that is the off the shelf application. So somebody's gone out and they've invested in a ERP or a CRM or a billing system as an application asset. And what we're saying is that the real asset is not necessarily just the application. It's actually the things that go around the application, such as the business domain APIs. So not just the application APIs, which might be, you know, ODBC or Corba or, uh, or maybe even REST, 
um, or SOAP. Um, it's really the business level APIs, um, as well as the other things, the, the customizations, um, which you would maybe do within a microservices anti-corruption layer um, or those kinds of things. So the asset, we, we're saying that you can start out now easily within any organization by looking at an asset, which may be an official application, and then by expanding it's the team and the things that you associate with that asset, such as APIs, and the team around that asset, away from just being the asset specialists, but also being API designers and engineers and product managers, et cetera, then we can move an asset from being an application to an asset being a domain. Does that sound okay? Sounds yeah. good to me, Saul. <laughs> uh, now, we do have a, another question from James, uh, but we have about one minute left, and it, it's, a, it's a big one. Um, so just asking around uh, the, the whole project to product thinking um, yeah. requiring quite a transformation in um, the way a, a business thinks at, at a larger level. So at what level of the organisation do you target this sell message? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so we're trying to make it actionable um, for, for many people in the organization, right? So we're encouraging um, if you're a developer in a team or if you're in a central API team, all the way through to uh, if, you're, if you're a manager and an executive in an organization, um, we would like you to, to start this conversation and start this thinking because it doesn't need to be something that requires um, you know, formal structure approach or or indeed um, a great deal of change to the way that you're delivering at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um